Okay, this is session four to our history of Jerusalem, Israel, and the Jewish people. And uh, part of the purpose of this is to help prepare people who are going to Israel just to be able to understand the, the culture, the dynamics, from the politics to everything that's going on, especially the, the, uh, the religious aspect of it and the Christian aspects of it. And so because of that, this is good for anybody, actually. So today, we're going to do, we're going to begin by briefly tracing where all the Jews went after 70 AD. Um, and uh, I mean, whole books are devoted to this subject and certain periods. So we're going to we're going to pretty much go all the way from 70 AD to World War II in one session here. Okay, so, um, so let's kind of jump into it. Okay, remember... At the time of 70 AD, Rome destroys Jerusalem. And uh, at that time, Jews were located in Israel, but about half the Jews were located in other communities throughout the Roman world, and especially in the area of Babylon, Iraq, Iran, present day countries there. And there are also pockets all throughout North Africa as well as you know, uh, in, you know, the uh, uh, north of the Mediterranean Sea as well. Well, at this time, everyone or, or most of the Jews had to leave in 70 AD or within three or four years afterwards. There were still pockets of Jews, especially in the Galilee area. And we've kind of talked about this before a couple of sessions ago. But over the next sev several centuries, Jewish communities were strongest in the Galilee area, North Africa, and in the Babylon area. And of course, why Babylon? Because that's where they were before the captivity. Remember back in the Old Testament, in the time of Daniel. Uh, uh, Daniel. And of course, remember we talked about that, especially in the those next couple of centuries after 70 AD, there is a lot of uh, development of the rabbinic law and culture and basically having to re redefine Judaism because the old system of the temple and the sacrifices and all that was completely gone away with. And so there was a, there was a reshaping, re rethinking what is Judaism and what does it mean to be a Jew? Well, after Constantine, remember he's the emperor that introduced or allowed Christianity to fully you know, take place in the Roman Empire, there was persecution from Christian Rome against the Jews. In fact, it was against all the other faiths besides Christianity. And, uh, and sadly, even some of the church fathers that we so appreciate a lot of their writings were very, um, you know, almost kind of ugly toward, you know, the Jewish population. And, uh, and so a lot of the Jews sort of moved out of the Rome area. They moved out of, you know, the present day Turkey, Greece area, and they kind of went to North Africa where it was a little bit more favorable conditions and also in that Babylonian area. Well, if we kind of fast forward, remember we talked about the Byzantine Empire. This is probably 500, 600, 700, and also the uh, medieval uh, Islamic um, age, there's a lot of learning where in Western Europe, <clears throat> learning had just kind of just declined. It, it pretty much kind of stopped. Well, in Byzantine Empire, which is again the eastern part of the old Roman Empire that centered around, um, you know, Constantinople or later Istanbul, you know, and uh, in Greece, in that area, it flourished. And also the Islamic kingdoms a little bit further east, they also became centers of learning. In fact, at that period of time, it was the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic empires that where you had most of the learning. And the Jews were right in the center of all that, you know, uh, and they prospered. You know, they got involved in finances, they got involved in trade, they got inf involved in lending money and banking. And part of the reason is because they were scattered 
but yet they had close relationships to one another. And so they were people who kind of, you know, were all around. And so it just was kind of a natural fit for them and, and they prospered. Well, again, I'm kind of going pretty um, uh, fast here. In the 900s, we see the flowering of Jewish civilization in Muslim Spain. Now, we didn't really kind of talk about this, but Islam, when they kind of went across North Africa in the 600s, 700s, they then went up into the Iberian uh, Peninsula where Spain and Portugal were. And so really for about 300 years, 700 to 1,000, 1,050, Spain and Portugal, present-day Spain and Portugal, were Muslim. In fact, uh, those of you who know Spanish, you know that there's actually a lot of words in Spanish that are very similar, or their roots are very similar to Arabic, you know. Uh, but th that's kind of another subject, though. And uh, you also see some Jews beginning to emerge in Northern Europe along the trade routes, and mainly for the purpose of trade. But the Jewish civilization in, Mus in, in Muslim Spain became somewhat distinct from the Jews in the Baghdad area, the Baghdad Babylonian area. In fact, in Spain, you had the rise of Jewish literature, Jewish poets. You had rabbinic academies that all of a sudden kind of sprung up everywhere. And uh, in fact, when Jews today look back in their history, they say that really what happened in Spain was really sort of a pinnacle. It was kind of at a, it was a highlight of Jewish civilization. And, uh, and again, it happened away from Galilee. It happened away from Babylonian. Um, and of course, as the Christians retook Spain and, and, um, and Portugal, the Jewish community was you know, the, the Muslims left, but the Jewish community, they were there, and they were sort of like the bedrock of the, uh, of uh, society and the, and the, uh, and, uh, the, the civilization there. Um, now, let's kind of just jump up to Europe. About 1,000 A.D., you also started seeing Jewish communities spring up in Germany, especially along the Rhine River. Why was that? trade routes, because remember, they were the ones that were trading. They'd kind of bring spices from further south into, into you know, northern Europe. They would do a lot of that, you know. So, and then you actually begin to kind of see, uh, you know, some of the Jews moving into present-day France. And rabbinic schools started springing up, especially in Germany, 1,000, 1,100. Now, during the Crusades, because I mean, we talked about like that during the, you know, the Crusade period earlier, which is 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, you had several, you, you, persecution in Europe started happening uh, toward the Jews. And uh, in fact, there were several major massacres, very ugly, unfortunately. And in the 1,100s and 1,200s, you started seeing restrictions on the Jews. You know, they weren't allowed to serve in the military. They weren't allowed to uh, serve, um, you know, in the government. They weren't allowed to buy land because all of a sudden there's this paranoia because they were prospering. And, you know, whenever someone's doing well, there's that general tendency, well, there must be some reason why they are prospering. And, um, and, and in Europe, just like they did in the Babylonian area, a lot of the Jews, because they were restricted from the military and government, they turned to lending money. And, uh, and that's part of where you start getting this. Even today, there's all these, you know, you hear all these conspiracy theories about the Jews trying to take over the world through their money. And that really kind of happened. That started in the 1100s, 1200s in Europe. Well, in 1290, England expelled all Jews. It got so bad. And France did it in 1306. And then again, they did it in 1380. And, uh, and usually after a while, you know, the, the Jewish community had some things that, you know, these countries needed. And so they gradually kind of came back in. But we start seeing a pattern of persecution of Jews. 
Now, the other thing that kind of happened in this part of the Middle Ages was uh, the Black Death, you know, the plague. And again, the Jews were blamed for the Black Death. They were the ones that were spreading this disease. And so you had a lot of ballads, you know, songs, you had plays, you had poetry, and they all reinforced these, this idea that the Jews were bad news and they were the ones that brought the black, you know, the black plague, the black death. Um, in the 1200s, you also actually see quite a number of Jews converting to Christianity. And uh, that actually made things worse for Jews. Now, when I say converting to Christianity, I should probably say converting to, you know, uh, the Christianity of the Middle Ages. Uh, I don't think it was probably really heartfelt. It was probably more out of convenience. But you, you see that happening now. And that's why a lot of times, you know, even today, uh, you know, these uh, Ancestry.com, you know, sites and, you know, places that kind of trace your uh, uh, ancestry, a lot of people kind of come up with, you know, quite a bit of Jewish blood because even though they, they think, well, you know, I don't have any Jewish history, but it probably traces back to the 1200s, 1300s. Okay, I know I'm kind of going through this fast, but I'm trying to give you just a, a brief outline here. Um, the Jewish communities in Babylon were um, influenced a lot by the Jews of the Babylonian area era. So Europe was really influenced a lot by that, the Jews, because the trade routes went through there. But it was in the 1100s that all of a sudden there is a new um, idea that kind of, or new set of ideas that sprung up in Judaism, and that was Kabbalah. And Kabbalah was a uh, it was definitely rooted in Judaism, but it had a lot of mysticism involved in it. In fact, it's still very popular today. I know when I when I was living in Mexico City, I ran across a people who were really into Kabbalah, and of course they were Gentiles, but they were oh this is this is the answer, you know. So today it almost has a new age, probably did back then to feel to it, and that really started in Safat, in Galilee just about 30, 40 minutes north of the Sea of Galilee. It's actually a beautiful town. And uh, those going to uh, Israel, Safad is one of my favorite places to go because it just has a lot of culture. It's a, it's, it looks like a medieval city. And, and of course, it was in the medieval times in the, you know, you had this rise of Kabbalah. And I'll let you kind of look up more of the, you know, on your own, just all the, you know, uh, distinctions of that. But Kabbalah arrived in the late 1100s in southern France, and it began actually began to kind of spread up into Eastern Europe eventually. Okay, let's go back to Spain now. Uh, Spain, remember I told you that's where the Jewish community was really the largest. It was probably the most educated, sophisticated, influential. You know, they, uh, it was also one of the oldest Jewish communities. I mean, I mean, I guess you could say Galilee and, and uh, you know, the Baghdad, Babylonian area too. But, but you, had, you had a lot of Jews here. And, but as the tides sort of went against Jews on March 31st, 1492, yes, that's the year that Columbus discovered, uh, discovered America, all Jews were expelled from Spain. And, uh, and you had a big chunk of the population that just had to leave over the next three or four years. And in fact, in Jewish history today, they talk about three main events that were just really horrible. 70 AD, March 31st, 1492 in Spain, and then, of course, the Holocaust. Those were like three defining events in Jewish history. And, um, you know, probably 100,000 Jews left just in 1492, uh, hundreds of thousands of others in the next three or four years. Some went to Portugal, but after about five years, they were expelled or banished from Portugal too. Most went to Italy and to North Africa 
and present day Turkey, which is the Ottoman Empire. And, uh, and there's a lot of literature, especially in Jewish circles. And in fact, you can kind of, you know, even non-Jewish circles of, you know, just the heart wrenching um, time this was for the Jewish, uh, the Spanish Jews. And, uh, and actually it caused a new interest in the coming Messiah. He's got to be coming. It, it started producing a survival mentality because he was very rooted for hundreds of years, you know, four or five hundred, six hundred years probably in Spain. Okay, so in Italy, the Jews prospered, they flourished, they were actually some of the key participants in the Renaissance. And also around this time, Kabbalah keeps growing. And, um, and so, um, um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in the 1400s, 1500s, you know, um, the, um, but eventually the Jews ran into problems in Italy too. And so they began to migrate north, especially into Eastern Europe. And uh, Prague was one of the uh, main centers of Judaism after that. And by the way, it still it has a real rich history of Judaism, and uh, which is probably another story. All these are probably another stories. So the other thing I kind of mentioned was the Ottoman Empire, which was what based in Turkey. It was it controlled the northern Africa, Middle East area. They actually welcomed. Jews from Spain. And, uh, and what was that? Where they had education, they had money, they had needed skills. Uh, they were especially very good in medicine and banking and trade. And the Ottoman Empire felt like we really need these people. And so they just opened the doors wide open. Okay, let's go back to Safat in Israel, in Galilee, the area of Galilee. And it emerges as a new Jewish center, mainly because of the Kabbalah. You know, in fact, by the end of the 1500s, there were probably at least 10,000 uh, Jews in living in Safat, which was a very high number for Jews living in Israel, because remember, it was under the Ottoman Empire by this time. Okay, I know I'm kind of jumping around, but I'm trying to give kind of a feel of all the things that are happening. Let's go up to Poland and Lithuania. By the early 1700s, there were at least 200,000 Jews. And it sort of developed as the largest, most developed Jewish population in the world. So we kind of see if at one point it was Babylon, then it kind of went to where? The Spain area. And then over the next couple hundred years, the Poland-Lithuanian area emerged as sort of being the most developed and largest uh, Jewish population. And academies started springing up. And this is very important to kind of understand the history of, of what, some of the stuff that's happening in, in, um, in Israel today. Uh, the Jews in this Poland, Lithuania, Eastern European area uh, they began to be influenced by this, by uh, the uh, Kabbalism, you know, that started in Safat. And it starts to merge in with other ideas that they were coming in. And so what happens, you have like a new, um, you have a new movement that emerges that mixes Kabbalah with other, you know, parts of Judaism. And it is known as uh, um, has Hasidicism, Hasidicism, and you know the the Hasidic, Hasidic Jews, you know, and uh, these are the ones that you you know even today, you know, the, the ones that wear the black and they they wear their hats and you know they have the beards and there's a there's a whole culture and all sorts of traditions that are associated with that, you know, and uh, Hasidic Judaism ends up uh, dominating the eastern part of Europe for a long time. And they also are a very influential part of what's happening in Israel even today. Okay, 
I'm, I know, I keep jumping around. Let's go to Amsterdam. Actually, the largest city that had Jews in Western, Euro in Western Europe, not Eastern Europe, was Amsterdam. And Amsterdam becomes a leading commercial center for Europe in the 1700s, early 1800s, and a lot of it is because of the Jewish population. And um, so maybe at this point I should probably kind of say there's two groups of Jewish peoples. And even today, they're kind of divided into two groups. There's the Sephardic, Sephardic Jews, and they descended from Spanish Jews. And, uh, and they ended up going to North Africa, you know, the Middle East, like around Turkey area and all that. And then they also went to Amsterdam, not to Eastern Europe, but to Amsterdam area. And their language was Ladino. And it's very similar to Spanish. In fact, if you kind of hear Ladino, you, you know, you can kind of pick out a lot of words. In fact, I, there's one pastor, um, a Messianic Christian that I know in Tel Aviv. And he said, oh, yeah, I know Spanish. And uh, he actually visited our house. And he was, uh, he was Sarfitic Jew. And he spoke Ladino. Actually, his parents spoke it. And he claimed to understand, you know, Spanish and, uh, and he didn't understand it completely, but he could kind of get the gist of what was happening. Then there's the Ashkenazic Jews and that's the other group and their descendants, they're the Jews that dominate, uh, Germany, Eastern Europe, France, but not Amsterdam. And their language evolved into what we now call Yiddish, and they still speak Yiddish a lot. Okay, so there's two groups there. There's the uh, Sephardic Jews, and there's the Ashkenazic Jews. And even today in Israel, they divide themselves up in these two groups. Okay, let's kind of jump into the French Revolution. Actually, the French Revolution, um, because they got rid of a lot of the the uh, church state, you know, connections. They got rid of, you know, it was kind of like everyone's citizens. They actually, the Jews became more free, especially in France. And so France begins to attract many Jews, you know. And also about this time, we're kind of in the 1800s now. Also in England as well becomes kind of a area. We mentioned this in the last session that in Napoleon, when he was in Egypt and Palestine, although he never got to Jerusalem, he promotes the idea, one of the first ones in modern history, that the Jews should somehow get to go back to Israel and repopulate there. So I just want to kind of mention that. Okay, so the 1800s, what was happening? One of the things we see is that a lot of Jews, certainly not all of them, but a lot of the Jews began to abandon their more traditional modes of Jewish life. Um, a lot of them started, stopped speaking Yiddish or Ladino, their languages. Men started shaving their beards. Ah, that was really, you know, they dressed in normal attire. You know, uh, traditional Jewish schools began to kind of disappear. And the result was what? More Jews became educated. And they... Uh, actually rose to, to the top of the, uh, you know, the educational cir circles. And this is really sort of the beginning of the more modern Judaism, where it's not so steeped in tradition and, you know, the, the Torah, and it's, it's, it's more free. But they also, it freed them also to kind of get more involved in, in, you know, just, um, you know, everyday society. And um, so it was also during the 1800s that J the Jewish population in Poland, Lithuania, and parts of Russia reached about a million and a half. And that, like I said, ended up being the largest population. Amsterdam was the biggest city, but this was the largest population of 
Jews in, in a region. In the late 1800s, there's a lot of turmoil, turmoil going on in the Jewish community. One thing is the beginning of Zionism. And Zionism was that belief that the Jews need to have their own land. And it, it you know, and it eventually developed into, we need to go back to Palestine. We need to go back to Israel. Uh, some sorry promoting at first the idea, well, maybe there's uh, some sections in Africa, like in Uganda, that maybe we can go there. Some kind of suggested, you know, going to America and starting, you know, but uh, uh, Zionism, especially out West, uh, some place, some people suggested parts of South America, but gradually it became, let's go back to where we started, Israel. And uh, one of the leading, well, actually he's considered father of Zionism is Theodore Herzl. In fact, uh, you know, it seems like about every one out of about every six or seven streets is named Herzl in uh, Israel today. And that's an exaggeration, but you see that a lot. And, um, and he, um, he called together the first Zionist Congress in 1897. It met in Basel, Switzerland, and the cry was, return to Israel. And soon, it, Zionism kind of broke up in a lot of subgroups because there's so many Jewish cultures. You know, you had the Ladino and the Yiddish, and people from Russia saw things different from, you know, the Jews in German, Germany. And so it was, it was, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of just sorting out what do we really want. But Zionism was a big movement that eventually led to the, you know, the uh, Israel becoming its own nation. So I just want to kind of mention that there. Um, now, on the other hand, some Jews really rejected Zionism. And they said, no, we're going to wait for Messiah to come. And he's going to kind of bring us back to Israel. And if we try to do it ourselves, it's going to be a disaster. So you had two groups of Jews um, you know, debating on this whole area of whether or not to go back to Israel or not. The more religious Jews, especially the Hasidic Jews, they especially took the approach, no, we're not going to go to Israel. We're going to wait for the Messiah. And that's one reason why so many of the Jews in Eastern Europe, Poland, Lithuania, Germany, got caught up in the Holocaust because they refused to leave and and to immigrate to, you know, Israel. Okay, the other thing that kind of happens in the late 1800s is the rise of pogroms. And pogroms were, uh, they're big in Russia, they're big throughout Eastern Europe and other parts of Europe too, where Jewish communities were just, uh, you know, they were just destroyed. I mean, they, uh, you know, uh, People, either civilians or usually sometimes authorized government people, they would kind of come in and they would just tear apart the, uh, you know, the Jewish community and, you know, the stores and, and force them to start leaving. Fiddler on the Roof, you know, centers in around, you know, the movie uh, on a pogrom in Russia in the late 1800s, maybe even early 19... Uh, early 1900s, they were, uh, you know, uh, you know, going on actually between 1881 and 1914, the beginning of World War uh, One, three million Jews moved out of Eastern Europe. That's how big the population got. Where did they go? A lot of them went to kind of Western Europe, like France, England, but many of them ended up going to the United States. And that's where the big first wave of Jews coming into the United States was during that 1881 to 1914, World War One. let's just say, time frame. And some began to move into Latin America, especially Mexico and Argentina. Okay. Um, many of the secular Jews also began to get involved in the Marxism movement. Leon Trotsky was a uh, example of that. Of course, there are a lot of Gentiles that are involved in Marxism as well. 
But those who are against the Jews, they came up with, they're just all Marxists and they're trying to destroy our society. And so uh, that added to kind of the whole persecution. In fact, that's kind of what happened in Germany, you know, under Nazi Germany, you know, the Jews, they're communist. And they're also, uh, and also they're greedy bankers, which is, you know, which is really kind of the opposite extreme because, you know, they're saying they're capitalists and they're also Marxists at the same time. But um, in America, the Jews began to flourish and many Jews called America the golden land. In fact, that's what America was called among Jewish communities in Europe, the golden land. Okay. Just a couple other things I just want to mention real quick here. Um, after World War I, because remember the Ottoman Empire controlled Palestine into then. After World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire was divided up among the, the, uh, the winners of World War I. And England was assigned the responsibility of Syria and Jordan and Israel, France, more Lebanon. And they called this the British mandate. And because all of a sudden the British controlled uh, Palestine uh, after World War I until they got their independence in 1948. And, uh, and so it was during the British mandate that Israel kind of Palestine changed a lot and and a lot of the policies that the British had very frankly caused have caused a lot of the problems that are even there today you know um, and we'll kind of talk about that more the next time but um, you also see a lot of Jews from Europe and from America actually moving to Israel and it was the beginning of the kibbutz movement. And the kibbutz were these, uh, where you just have, everyone kind of joined the kibbutz, they were pretty free, but they decided to live in common. They didn't have any personal property and they would take the land and they would, they would, I mean, they, they did, you know, amazing things in changing, you know, dry desert areas into, you know, productive agricultural areas, you know, in fact, uh, before World War II, uh, you know, uh, the best oranges in the world, you know, and, and the favorites among Europeans were the ones grown in Palestine and they were grown on these kibbutzes and the kibbutzes were not very, the people in the kibbutzes, they, it kind of came out of the Zionist movement. And so they weren't very religious. I mean, they might believe in God and they believed in Jewish culture and tradition, but it was a lot of intellectuals and the kibbutz culture ended up being the foundation for Jewish life and culture in Israel. Uh, you know, most of, most of, almost all the leaders of Israel for the first 30 years, maybe even more grew up in kibbutzes, you know, and, uh, and they, it was, it was, uh, that's where, it, there's a lot of good things about the kibbutzes, you know, hard work was a, you know, uh, taking care of one another. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that happened. And also they began to experiment because you had all these Jewish cultures from around the world kind of coming together and joining these kibbutzes. And it became examples of what a melting pot of what Israel would end up being later. The first kibbutz was formed in 1909. Almost at the beginning, they're all agricultural, but then in later years, they launched out to other enterprises. And today they're involved in high tech, they're involved in tourism, they're involved in a lot of things. You know, um, uh, communal living is at the heart of it. I've kind of visited several kibbutz, you know, uh, had people who kind of grown up at kibbutz. I have a good friend, he kind of took me into their dining rooms and, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing you know, uh, what they did. And, uh, these were supposed to be utopian communities. They obviously had problems, you know, but they did quite a bit, you know, uh, they were, uh, uh, many people point out that socialism was kind of definitely mixed in with Zionism during the kibbutz area because of the, um, 
communal living. However, we could probably also say that they were against, you know, the authoritarian aspects of communism. Actually, there's another word I want to kind of introduce, and that is Elia or Elia. And, uh, and making Elia means I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm going back to Israel. And so that becomes a very important phrase between World War I and World War II. Are you going to make Elia? And it's still a very important term. Okay, I think that's probably a good place to kind of stop. I know we've covered a lot. Let me just kind of mention uh, a couple things. Uh, if you're interested in more, there's uh, Abba Eban wrote a book, Heritage, Civilization of the Jews. It's got lots of maps. It's got all sorts of just beautiful stories. And he also kind of has a, uh, a source reader where he has a lot of uh, original writings that are just really fascinating. You know, and I would really, if you're interested in this, all the details, you know, you know, this 30, 40 minutes expanding into hours and hours of much more details, that would be a good source. As far as movies, probably the best movie that probably describes maybe some of what we talked about is Fiddler on the Roof. A lot of people have watched it, but it's about the Hasidic Judaism in Eastern Europe. You see the pogrom, you see, you know, the choice. Okay, once they would kind of split up, where are they going to migrate to? You know, some of them said, well, maybe, maybe we'll make Aaliyah. Others kind of West Africa, but a lot of them ended up going to America. So it, it's a very good movie to kind of give the background. Okay, thank you very much.